I'm really glad I got to do this. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I think you're looking at a live picture and the slide of the talk today. Can you hear me? Is there a five by five? Peter, thank you. The audio, the microphone is working. You can hear me okay. This is a new way that I'm starting this. Thank you, the Dutch night owl. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Let me. Let me get you into the room then, and we can uh, look deeply into each other's eyes. You know what? Uh, let me say right now, before I do that, that the local time is 11.48 a.m. And if you're watching this in replay, uh, the lecture will start in 12 minutes at the top of the hour. But for you watching the replay, you go ahead and fast forward 12 minutes to the beginning of the talk. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. How's it going, everybody? It's really nice that you could join us live. We have 135 watching at the moment, and I suppose folks will continue to pour in. Where are you viewing from? And I'll keep an eye that we're still working audio-wise. And then we will uh, get Tyler's microphone, our speaker, Tyler's microphone going uh, in a few minutes, but not right now. Hi, Gary, in Hood River, Oregon, and Lou is in Reno, Nevada, Half Moon Bay, California, uh, California. Eric's in Marion, Virginia. Oh, these are familiar sounding places. Saber's still in Mexico. Kirk's in Philomath. Glasgow, Scotland. Buell, Idaho. Oh, my God, almost every place is, is the old veterans here. Camino Island. Canal, BC, that's Sean. Selwood, Oregon. Cincinnati, Ohio. Alberta, Gary. Oh, Katoks, Gary. No promises that I'll remember that the next time. Lincoln, Nebraska. Lake Oswego, Oregon. Keezer, Oregon. You guys all have snow, I think, huh? I was thinking of driving to the Oregon coast this weekend. I don't think I'm going to do that. Don's up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Garrett, the Dutch night off from the Netherlands. Norley's back. I watched her episode this morning from the Atlas Mountains in the Sahara, for goodness sake. I mean, boy, she is immediately into what I consider the best of the best of what she has to offer. Solo riding in a very unique way on a continent and countries that I've never really even thought about. Amazing stuff. Hans is in the Netherlands. Chuck is in Nuevo Colón, Costa Rica. Hi, Chuck. Vancouver, Washington, frozen Calgary. That's right, Diane. Or yeah, Auburn, California, and snowing. Yeah, I'm sure many of you folks who never get snow are experiencing snow really for the first time, or for the first time in a very long while. Okay, I think what? Picking my teeth. Uh, let me swing you around and. In a few minutes, we will get uh, Tyler's mic going. Really small crowd today for some reason. It's late in the quarter. That makes sense to me that everybody's cramming for the next round of midterms. But I don't, it's almost like I don't want to swing you around. There's nobody here. It's like it's just a few people. I'm kind of pissed, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Uh, No, I'm not going to swing you around to show you a room full of empty seats. I guess they're all late arriving. Listen, have you ever been at a university late in a quarter, like the last two weeks of the quarter, last three weeks of the quarter? I'm rolling my eyes because if, if you know, you know, I guess, what this experience is like. You know, people don't have their act together, students I'm talking about. They haven't been planning. So now there's all this work. They're overwhelmed, they're sobbing, they're excuses galore. And on the other end of it, it stinks to have to listen to all that. And sometimes I'm sympathetic and sometimes I'm not. And uh, 
It's like all you needed to do is plan a little bit. All you needed to do was not procrastinate, and then we wouldn't be in this situation. All right. Cramming is a lifestyle. It, it, it's feeling like that more and more. I don't know. Hey, what's going on, man? There's three field trips today. Huh. Why would we schedule a field trip on a Friday? Oh. Thank you, Walter. The explanation for the empty seats are there are field trips, not from geology classes, but from bio, biology, the biology field trips. There's a couple other ones that are students going to do job interviews on the West Side. Oh, my God. Some yeah. people are doing job interviews on yeah. the West Side. Lame. Okay, I'm kidding. All right. Okay. So, all right. I feel Walter's talking me out of it. He's, he's, he's making me feel okay. But this is not about me. Let's turn on uh, Ty Tyler's microphone, make sure we're functional there. And that'll give us a couple minutes if there's a problem. Thanks again for joining us. If you just joined us, the lecture will start in seven minutes. I felt that you wish it was a couple weeks earlier, so during the summer, so not during the first week of school. But yeah, that's the way it goes. You know, it's like time for like time. I hate to interrupt. That's okay. Should I'm I turn it on? Hi. Are you reaching for your microphone? Turn turn your microphone on, Marie. Yeah, press and hold. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, this is a little iPad here. Uh, Tyler, what's cool. your middle name? David. David. And uh, what time did you leave the house this morning down the Tri Cities? Oh, 7:30. 7:45. Yeah. Smooth sailing. You didn't have to deal with drifting snow or something. No, it was actually there. really nice. Yeah. yeah, it was a nice drive. There was Good. no one else on the road. So, okay. yeah. Uh, viewers, can you type uh, Tyler Good or Tyler 5x5, five five, please? Oh, Garrett's already done that. How do you pronounce that? Taupo. Taupo. Are you going to talk a little bit about Taupo today? I actually will. That's okay. the focus of the entire talk. My God. <laughs> I did notice that the title you gave me is a little different than the title I saw. Yeah. Which is totally fine, but yeah. I'll, I'll make a change to that title slide. That's pretty much what That's what we're talking about today. Right, yeah. right. Okay, good. Tyler, Tyler, you're perfect, according to Oscar in San oh, Diego. Sweet. Thanks, Oscar. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I think we'll just keep you on, if you don't mind, yeah. and just, uh, yeah, five-minute warning or so. Um, so you knew Marie from Oregon State as well. I didn't know her, but oh, okay. uh, she, we, she knows our, we have a mutual friend, Nicole. Oh. Yep. Nicole, who was here. Is that the Nicole who was here? Yep. Yeah. I work with. I went to New Zealand with Nicole when um, for her, her master's was funded by the same project as my PhD. Oh, we are we are infiltrating this little cell. We we're, sure we're, are. We're getting damn near everybody from this I little know. group. Well, that's cool. Who's next? I don't Who's know. Who's next from this group? So you know Nicole quite a bit down in. Are you in the same office or same way? Uh, we're te we technically work on different teams, but okay. we do a lot of similar work. She's nice. she's we worked together quite a bit. We actually just submitted a abstract to Goldschmidt together so cool. yeah Good. small world it is well um don't feel like you have to be stranded up here if you want to go talk to those guys it's fine but we're good and i'll i'll do a very short intro written for me as you know mm -hmm. and we'll get to you uh, just a few minutes after the top of the hour sounds good thanks tyler Okay, everybody, the room is starting to fill in so i'm going to swing you around can i double check one more time both <clears throat> both uh both Nick and Tyler are five by five. If I see that again, then I won't worry about it. And the only thing to worry about is the tracking camera, which has died the last three times I've tried to use it. Both are five by five. Thank you, Jim. Okay, well, enjoy the lecture today. Thank you. Nice. I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, I heard Burp the whole time. <laughs> I'm on my card. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Get this gratuitous volcano okay, shot. Kathy Cashman. I mean, she's the best. She's the rock lifter. Yeah. yeah. It's from her 2017. It's from the same paper. As How was the review session? Yeah. Oh, you guys were all in it? Well, Did somebody say, Chris, we got to stop. We got to go get some dinner. I'm excited. Dinners. I'm nervous. I'm ready for it to I know. get going. <laughs> Was you still in there? You just, yeah. you just, you just got up and left? <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, green oh, rocks, really? Chris. Yeah. It's the time. It got really cold again out. recently. Monday. So. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Five degrees. Is All right. Well, yeah. yeah. Is your small? Have you registered, Josh? She's 45 pounds. She's bigger than Fuji, yeah. but she's, she's like a solid medium size dog. She's got like long, spindly legs, but like a big like chest. You'll see a picture of her at the end. Good. She's a mutt. Who yeah. else? We think she's a like Staffordshire Terrier. Oh, okay. All right. Because she's got that weird little like humped back yeah, and like yeah. a, like a skinny backbone. I totally get and she's super bouncy and like spastic. Yeah. Nip a little. Fine. They'll figure it out. Okay. Because Fuji, her MO is she gets close to smell and then she nips. Uh, they're, all got, they're all back so from the job interview. I think it'll be a plan. Freya will just run away. I mean, she is this small. Freya will be able to outrun her. Freya is very fast. Wait, then that's perfect because then they can chase each other. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Would you small? She's so much smaller than I thought she would be. I, I think she was Were just. You like a new, yeah, a new I think I just saw her as a puppy and I was like, she's gonna grow up. Nope. Be, nope. <laughs> it's like she she doubled in size and then just stayed. She was like five pounds. She was this big, five pounds, and now she's twenty. Yeah, and she's not gonna grow anymore. Yeah, when we got Freya. She was like eight and a half or something. And now she's forty-five. Yeah, that's a, that's a great size. That's how big we thought Fuji would be. Then yeah. Just was, we didn't know she was in the yeah. I don't think you could tell when they're all, when they're mid. When they're... But I mean, it was, it's a bamboozle, though, because the person who sold to us was like, oh, she's going to be huge. Hmm. That's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So that's Marie. Oh, yeah. So she's running the. ICPMS. Awesome. Cool? Yeah. She was, she's still finishing her PhD at OSU. Yeah, Nicole mentioned pretty, that. Pretty tough. Mm -hmm. She did a lot of pro work. Yeah. <laughs> she ran that probe like five. Yeah, you guys have a triple, you have well, a well, agile well, well. triple quad, right? Is it oh, a 8900? Keep it coming over. I think Nicole <laughs> I mentioned it's the same instrument that we have. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, they're ve they're pretty uh, cool. It's probably it's pretty smaller. It's a smaller crowd. Oh really? Yeah. It's it's I'll wait for these you. triple quad instruments are incredible. <laughs> like you can use reaction gases. They're pretty powerful. There's only three hundred people It's like the chlorine live, isotopes I've been wait. working on measuring. We, we, use, we put oxygen in the reaction cell and it reacts away <laughs> things, <laughs> interferences. Oh, so. Is it good for like mass resolution? <laughs> Like why is the reactive? Oh, it's just good for cleaning out stuff. It's, it helps on. get rid of interferences because it's you know you you're not doing any. It helps you minimize the front end chemistry you need to do. Yeah. Well, that's cool. yeah. yeah um, are you gonna throw a laser on the front? Yes, we uh, have a laser. Are you free like, at like no, one o'clock, two o'clock today? Well, I'd just okay. like to visit with you You're and see how things are going. I haven't really seen her yet, really. So. You should be able to do all of that with that instrument. Yeah. Quickly. I mean, I think it's one of the, it's, it's Agilent's best instrument. I, I like Agilent more than Thermo in my experience, but... Because uh, I love the idea of doing work in house. Yes, you'll be able to do all the you'll be able to do all the same stuff that uh, that you can collect at LSU with their laser system. Because <clears throat> that system at LSU is awesome. Yes, that one's slightly different. But. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Whatever you, it's appropriate to say when it's exactly twelve o'clock. Thank you for being here today. We. We did fill the room. I was starting to get worried. We had mostly empty chairs, but people filled in. We had a mineralogy review session with Chris Mattinson and a bunch of other things. So thank you for being here. Let's not screw around. Can we thank Vinman's Bakery and Jeff who brought all this stuff? <laughs> what was uh, brought over today? Scones and bee stings. Bee stings are focaccia with uh, cheese and tomato sauce and ham and honey. The bee sting, I get it. 
And then what's what flavor of scone, Jeff, are we talking about? Lemon, currant, chocolate, orange, and something blueberry, lemon, blueberry, delightful. So thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. We have one more of these noon talks this quarter, and it's next Friday. And I want to remind you that it will be a very different talk than today. Uh, John Schellenberger will be giving a talk called Understanding Indigenous Landscapes on the Columbia Plateau. And I know John just a little bit, and he has amazing oral traditions to share. I really don't know what he's going to do, but as I've been getting to know him a little bit, I mean, he is really into all of these deep things that are normal. I'll save that introduction for next week. Okay, so <laughs> it'll, it'll be a, uh, a unique experience, and that's next Friday at noon. And then we're done for the winter quarter. Hannah and I have set up the spring quarter schedule, and we know exactly what's happening, but I'll save that until I guess next week we'll announce that. So let's get to our speaker today, Tyler Schleter from the Tri-Cities. He drove up from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory this morning, and he's been a close friend and collaborator with Hannah, and so she uh, hooked Tyler and got him to come up here. Uh, Tyler got his bachelor's uh, in geology at Oregon State University working under Adam Kent, master's degree from Northern Arizona University working with Mary Reed, a PhD recently from UC Davis working under Carrie Cooper, and now he's a research associate, a postdoc fellow or words to that effect in the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm not going to read the title because there's a slightly different title than uh, we had uh, posted, but it's the same content. So can we please uh, welcome Tyler this morning? Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, Nick. Um, and thank you all for joining me today. Um, today, uh, I'm going to be talking um, about some of the work I did during my PhD at UC Davis, which is focusing on um, really understanding what insights into silicic magmatic systems we can gain from looking at the zircon record. Um, and then I will also have a couple slides at the end talking a little bit about what I do at Pacific Northwest as part of my P uh, postdoc. So let's get into it. Uh, I just want to start with a little bit of context of why do we care about silicic magmatic systems? Why do we want to study these things and look um, and understand how they work? Well. There's the obvious, like they are responsible for volcanic eruptions. But uh, at a deeper level, they are also involved in the production and evolution of the continental crust, which we all live on, so that's nice. Um, they also play a role in cycling volatiles from the Earth's interior to uh, the atmosphere. And they play a role in the production of economic deposits, things like gold, silver, copper, things we use in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, these magmatic systems are involved in producing those deposits. Despite the fact that these are all important things that uh, silicic magmatic systems can uh, sort of provide to society, there's a lot that we still don't understand. Uh, for example, what do magma reservoirs actually look like in the subsurface? Uh, traditional models for what these things look like involved liquid-dominated, single magma bodies that were potentially on the order of, you know, super eruption scale volumes, hundreds of cubic kilometers, um, that perhaps were sustained in the crust for periods of time that were equivalent to like the lifetime of a volcanic edifice, so maybe hundreds of thousands of years. There's a lot of issues with this model when you, uh, when you look into it. Um, for example, sustaining a liquid dominated magma body in the crust for hundreds of thousands of years is really hard to do energetically. Um, they should be cooling as they're in contact with a cooler upper crust. Additionally, um, a lot of volcanoes produce crystal rich lavas on the order of up to 40 weight percent crystals, suggesting that they're not purely liquid in the subsurface. Additionally, um, using geophysical imaging techniques, they're really sensitive to seeing large bodies of liquid, and you just don't see large magma bodies under most reservoirs with geo, under most volcanoes uh, with geophysics. So uh, these sort of 
observations challenged this traditional model of, of what magma reservoirs look like, which has led to this newer sort of paradigm shift in what these things look like, where instead we think of them more as pr probably transcrustal systems that are involve a crystal rich mush with lenses of melt rich zones distributed throughout. Um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty of what these things really look like. And so today, we're just gonna focus on the very upper part of one of these systems. Um, so when I say silicic magmatic system, I'm talking about the upper crustal part of the system, which is sort of the end result of this whole differentiation process in the crust. And it's what ultimately feeds volcanic eruptions. <clears throat> and so in sort of modern studies, like what Hannah and I do, it's not so much whether a mush system like this exists, but more of what does it look like? How is melt distributed throughout a mush system and how do they sort of evolve leading up to eruptions? Another major uncertainty is what processes and time scales actually drive melt accumulation. So how rapidly can you produce large volumes of eruptable magma? We know they have to be produced at some point because there are large super eruption scale volcanic eruptions, right? So at some point that volume of magma has to be down there. So how rapidly can you produce that? Um, and how do you produce that? So broadly, how are we gonna sort of address these questions about silicic magmatic systems? Well, much like tree rings, uh, crystals that grow within a magma body record information about the local environment as they grow. Um, here's just an image of plagioclase from um, Mount St. Helens, just to illustrate this. Um, so it's, it's a decent analogy, there's some complications, but broadly you can use the compositional information recorded in erupted crystals to try and understand what the magmatic system looked like at the time that those crystals grew. And today we're gonna to be focusing all on zircon. So just to give you some, just to sort of reiterate what the motivation of this work is, we're gonna be using the crystal record, specifically the zircon record today to try and understand what do these systems look like leading up to eruption and how rapidly can you produce large volumes of mobile, um, eruptable melt prior to eruption? How long does it take? So where are we gonna spend today? So today uh, we're gonna focus specifically on the Aruanui eruption. This is the world's youngest known super eruption. It was produced from within the Taupo Volcanic Center um, on the North Island of New Zealand. Here's just a simplified map of the structural caldera. For those of you who are unfamiliar with caldera systems, they're eruptions that are so large that they don't produce a conical edifice. They evacuate so much material that the, the upper crust sort of collapses down into a, a there's some subsidence because of the volume of magma, uh, magma erupted. Um, here's just an image of my team. Um, forgot to use the pointer. Um, here's the image of my team uh, collecting pumice from the Aruanui eruption in 2017. Um, this eruption uh, produced over 530 cubic kilometers of rhyolitic magma. Uh, it occurred about 25.4 thousand years ago. Um, and one thing I want to mention is that the erupted deposit itself is largely homogeneous. The, the, you can't go through the stratigraphy of the eruption and see significant changes in the uh, composition of the erupted material. And that will become important later. So what are we gonna be talking about data-wise? So all the data we're gonna talk about today is collected from zircon, which is an accessory mineral that's common in rhyolitic or silicic magmas. Um, specifically, we're gonna focus on uranium thorium crystallization ages collected from zircon, as well as trace element data from the same zircons. And we'll also be comparing um, both interior and surface uh, information from these crystals. And then you, as you can see here, this is just a picture of a zircon um, that we image before we analyze it. And then uh, shrimp RG is the method we use. It's an ion microprobe down at Stanford, and here's an, just an image of me using that instrument to collect these type of data. So why, why zircon data? Well, 
Zircon is particularly powerful because you can analyze individual spots within the crystal. And you can also analyze, you can collect age information and trace element information in the exact same location. This allows you to put the compositional information from the trace element data into a temporal context, um, which is very powerful. Additionally, you can collect surface information. So uh, shown here on in panel A, um, which gives you information about the last sort of latest stages of crystal growth. Um, and you can also uh, then take those crystals, polish them, and measure the interiors. So by coupling the surface and interior information from multiple crystals, you can sort of get a more holistic view of what the system looks like over time. So let's look at some data. Here I am showing um, uranium thorium crystallization ages from single zircon. Um, there's the ages are referenced at the top of the uh, figure for your reference. Um, I want to point out the, uh, the dashed red line, which may be kind of hard to see, is the eruption age of the Aruanui uh, deposit. So here we're looking at both zircon surface ages, which are recorded in, as the solid black line, and the dashed black line is zircon interior ages. And what you can immediately see is that our zircon interiors are recording a complicated multimodal age distribution that spans hundreds of thousands of years, whereas our surface population yields a single eruption age peak. And I measured over 101, 105 zircon surface ages. And statistically, they yield one single peak, suggesting that those zircons were continuing to sort of crystallize right up until eruption. So now let's look at the trace element data that's associated with these. So here I'm showing uh, uh, yttrium over phosphorus versus ytterbium gadolinium data. It's color coded by uh, thorium uranium ratio. Um, the details of those elements are not really important right now. We just know that they are related to sort of the, the crystallization history of the magma. That's what kind of drives changes in these, these uh, chemical indices. And uh, what you can see clearly is that looking at the zircon surface information in panel A, you see two discrete zircon populations that are consistent across all three of our chemical uh, ratios that we're plotting here. However, if you look at the interior data, they span the same compositional range and appear sort of zoned in composition, but they're not isolated within two discrete populations. So an enticing interpretation of this data is that the zircon surfaces reflect growth within two compositionally distinct magma bodies. They might be two different melt bodies within the broader Aruanui system, whereas the interiors would reflect growth within a compositionally heterogeneous, long-lived mush. Um, this is an enticing interpretation. However, one thing we noticed when we were uh, sort of doing some other plagioclase work that I did, is that zircon is a common inclusion in a lot of other major mineral phases like plagioclase and amphibole. And so it's possible that the, the zircon groups are actually reflecting um, the host that the zircon is entrained within. Um, so before we placed any sort of petrologic context on what these uh, surface populations mean, we wanted to sort of understand uh, their relationship to, to zircon host. So the way we decided to do this is I took 15 grams of plagioclase from Aruanui. I dissolved it um, over the course of like three and a half weeks. It was a very long, arduous process. Um, and I actually sort of isolated the zircons that were included within the plagioclase crystals. Um, and then I did the same exact shrimp analyses on these, comparing surfaces and interiors for ages and trace element data. And I just want to make a note that from this point forward, um, I will refer to the, when I refer to plagioclase hosted zircon, these are the zircon that I liberated from these plagioclase crystals. Whereas 
uh, I will refer to the data we were just looking at as the whole rock hosted zircon because those are collected from bulk pumice crushes. And so we don't really know the petrologic context, what host they came from. So if you remember, we hypothesized that possibly one of these surface groups that we see in the whole rock zircon populations could be you know, derived from zircon that were liberated from plagiac place. So here I'm showing the same exact plots that I was showing before, but now instead of the whole rock interior data, I'm comparing the surface populations with the plagioclase hosted zircon surfaces. So as you can see immediately, the plagioclase uh, hosted zircon surfaces are not representative of one of our whole rock surface populations. So we can immediately rule out that, that these two whole rock populations are derived from different hosts of zircon. Um, and instead, our plagioclase hosted surfaces compositionally look much more similar to our whole rock zircon interiors. So just taking a step back and connecting this to the physical processes within the rev reservoir, this one gives us confidence that our whole rock zircon surface populations are indeed reflecting the compositional sort of regime that they crystallized in, likely two different compositional regimes within the reservoir. And two, that are, where our plagioclase are growing and trapping the zircon, um, it appears to be in the same location where our, our whole rock zircon interiors were growing in this compositionally heterogeneous, compositionally um, diverse mush. So we can try and support this observation if we think that our plagioclase hosted uh, zircon surfaces are, are similar to our whole rock interiors. We can compare the age distributions of these things uh, to see if that holds weight. And so here now we're just looking at the uranium thorium age distributions from uh, in black, our whole rock zircon, in purple, our plagioclase hosted zircon. And in fact, when you do compare these age distributions, the whole rock interior and plagioclase hosted zircons um, show very similar age distributions. They're complicated, diverse age distributions with multiple age peaks. And in fact, when you test these things statistically, even though it looks like there are some differences, there is um, the whole rock zircon interiors and the plagioclase surfaces and interiors are statistically indistinguishable. The only population that is distinctly different is the whole rock zircon surface population, which appears to have crystallized right up until eruption age. So now we can be confident that our surface groups that we observed in our whole rock zircon surface populations likely reflect growth within two compositionally distinct magmas. But we want to know their context to the broader magmatic system, the mush system. So in order to do this, we isolated whole rock zircons where we have surface and interior uh, data from the exact same crystal. And here I'm just showing the interior data for zircons that correspond to each surface group. And as you can see, there's sort of a heterogeneous distribution of zircons. There's no real discrete uh, compositional grouping within the zircon interiors. If you plot the surface groups on top of them, what you can see is that the surface populations are sampling zircon interiors that span the whole compositional range that's recorded in interior populations. So what this looks like is that, illustrating here schematically for, for visualization, it's obviously highly simplified, um, it appears that, that zircon interiors are extracted from the same broad, heterogeneous, possibly zoned crystal mush, and that there's a stage of evolution where those zircons are isolated in two compositionally distinct parts of the reservoir where we see the development of these two discrete um, populations. However, if you remember from earlier, I mentioned that um, the erupted deposit is pretty much homogenous. There's no major compositional zoning in the erupted material, the glass and, and sort of stratigraphically um, through the eruption deposit. 
Additionally, if you couple this with some major phase uh, information like plagioclase, um, there's a lot of evidence that the final erupted magma body was actively convecting and mixing and was homogenizing prior to eruption. So from the other information, we have strong evidence that there's this final stage of assembly um, that occurred prior to eruption. What's interesting is the zircon surfaces that we're looking at here don't show that homogenization process, right? If, if there's all this evidence that the system was homogenizing and actively convecting prior to eruption, why don't the zircon surfaces reflect that process? Why do they still show these two discrete compositions? Well, there's a variety of things we could dig into, but the, the, short, the long and short of it is that they could not have had enough time in that final erupted magma body to grow rims large enough to be sampled by our method. And so we can use the, the, this preservation of these two surface populations to try and place some constraint on how long that final stage of assembly prior to eruption occurred. So here, just plotting of the data we're gonna, uh, we're gonna use for this, but so we have our zircon compositional groups and we know that from our age distributions that our zircon surfaces were growing sort of right up until eruption. We also know that um, when you do this trace element analysis via the shrimp method, it samples the sort of outer two microns of the zircon. So if we had grown a large enough uh, surface on these zircons within that homogenized magma body, you would expect to see that homogenization process. So they couldn't have grown more than two microns while in that final magma body. So you can use growth rates from the literature to say how long can the can zircon survive in the in a homogenous magma body without growing rims that reflect that homogenization. And when you do that, you get a sort of broad range of two to 2,000 years where these zircon surface populations were in the actively convecting final erupted magma body. That's the amount of time they could have spent in that final magma body without homogenizing, growing homogenous rims. Um, and while that's a wide range, because we don't really know zircon growth rates really well, that's still relatively rapid. And two, two years is very rapid, 2,000 years, is still much faster than pre, sort of previously thought. So what this implies is that that final stage of a Ruinui um, magma body sort of accumulation couldn't have developed more than 2,000 years before eruption. And if you... Uh, I didn't put these on here, but there's a variety of other ways you can you can sort of get at this final assembly time scale, mostly diffusion chronometry and some other unique methods. They all agree uh, that the Aruanui system has ha sort of the final erupted magma body was produced on the order of decades to centuries, perhaps millennia at most um, prior to eruption. Okay, so just to synthesize this data. Um, we have our uh, whole rock zircon interior and our plagioclase zircon data that reflect uh, growth within a temporally long-lived, uh, compositionally heterogeneous system. This is likely reflecting growth within the sort of broad Aruanui mush system. Um, this is consistent with plagioclase data, which I plotted here just for um, comparison. Um, during my defense talk, where I had much more time, I had a whole spiel on plagioclase that we're just, we just don't have time for today. But so plagioclase and zircon data are all consistent with the interiors growing within the mush zone. Our new um, zircon surface ages and compositional information reveal a sort of second stage of evolution of the system um, that uh, includes extraction of zircon from the mush and development of two compositionally distinct melt bodies. Um, and that these zircons were like, or this, these two distinct compositional zones likely existed until at most a few thousand years prior to eruption. At which point you have uh, the sort of final assembly and accumulation of the erupted magma body that, uh, 
that occurred within 2,000 years of eruption. Um, and here is just, again, showing some plagioclase data where you see this homogenization process in, in plagioclase rims, um, but not in zircon. So yeah, um, now that's sort of our best guess or best interpretation of how you had lead up to this eruption. And so I want to just take a step back and say, how does this fit with other large caldera forming eruptions that fit in with uh, this sort of super eruption, hundreds, cubits, hundreds of cubic kilometers of magma erupted? How does this fit in more broadly? So this rapid final assembly time scale of the erupted magma body is becoming more and more commonly seen in large silicic systems. Um, this has been observed at Yellowstone, places like Santorini, the Long Valley caldera. It's becoming more and more widely accepted that rapid assembly time scales of the final erupted magma body seems to be a common thing. Additionally, um, this is something I didn't really get a chance to go into today, but the volume of accessible material or, or the volume of eruptable magma doesn't necessarily seem to be linked to the amount of time you have to, to grow that magma body. Um, it's, it seems like it might be more related to how much mush, how much of the broader mush system you can actually tap to grow that magma body. How interconnected is that mush system at the time that melt is accumulating. And one, one way that's been proposed to sort of supersize eruptions, for lack of a better term, um, is that you're actually tapping multiple discrete melt bodies. Um, so in the Aruanui system, it looks like we tapped two, based on our zircon record. Um, some highly detailed work on Yellowstone suggests it's you know, nine magma bodies or more. That might be one mechanism that will allow you to sort of ramp up the volume of, of material. Um, just want to make the caveat that this doesn't necessarily seem to be the case for the large crystal rich eruptions. They're a whole nother monster that I didn't study that a lot of other people are going to. So just want to make it clear that it's not consistent across the board, but that seems to be broadly the interpretations we can take. Okay, so that's the end of sort of the first part of my talk. Um, focusing on my PhD work. So what now, right? So I have been a postdoc at Pacific Northwest National Lab for about the last six months. Um, I got hired on to work with the radiochemistry group at PNNL. Um, and more specifically, I work with the low background materials and particle analysis team, which is a mouthful. Um, but hopefully today I'm just I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about a specific project here uh, because I've only been here for like six months. <laughs> but uh, I just want to give you some context of like what type of work is being done at a national lab um, and why you, they might be interested in hiring people with geosciences or geochemistry backgrounds. So broadly, what, what I and the rest of my team does is we work on what are known as rare event or fundamental physics experiments which ultimately strive to better understand some fundamental information about the universe, either directly detect things like dark matter, which we think has to be abundant, but we've never been able to detect, or understand important things about fundamental building blocks of the universe like neutrinos. Um, and while this is a stark transition from volcano science, um, they really like geosciences there. Uh, I'd say half the people I work with uh, have some geoscience or geochemistry background. So um, the work that's being done here you know, the, as students and, and faculty um, is readily applicable to the type of work that's being done here. So I just want to give you some context. As I mentioned, a lot of what I do is supporting rare event or fundamental physics experiments. But what does this mean? Well, these experiments are typically long, decade-long um, endeavors that are huge collaborations between multiple institutions that design, build, and ultimately implement these experiments, um, some of which are just shown here. These are uh, some examples of ones that have been recently completed or are proposed. And what these experiments are trying to do is they're searching 
for extremely rare particles or decay events that may only be observed once during a years long experiment. And in order to do this, it requires extremely sensitive detectors that are built in an extremely low activity environment. Um, because any spurious radioactivity can interact with the detector and basically hide the signal you're looking for. So there are two main ways that they go about doing this. One is they build these detectors deep underground to shield them from cosmic radiation. Um, there's one in South Dakota that I believe is like 2,000 meters underground or something. It's wild. And then the other thing they do, which is where I'm more involved, is they have to build these materials out of, they build these detectors out of materials that have extremely low radioactive elements in them. And so just to give you some context of why that's important, well, there's radioactive elements in everything at low levels. Um, and any sort of intrinsic radioactivity in the materials that are used to build these detectors will decrease the likelihood that you can actually observe the, the event that they're trying to observe. And so you need extremely radio pure materials in order to make these detector, give these detectors the highest probability of success. So the major players that we're mostly concerned with, um, there are some others, but the main ones are thorium and uranium, which lo and behold, we just talked about uranium thorium dating of zircon. It's the same exact decay chain that they're concerned with because you have uranium, but uranium is gonna produce all of these short-lived radioisotopes that can have different decay energies, different decay products that will interfere with their detector. So their goal is to try and eliminate the presence of uranium and thorium in materials to, to the degree as much as they can. What's challenging about this is these things, like I said, are ubiquitous in nature. Um, in the Earth's crust, you, you can expect sort of on average PPM levels of uh, uranium and thorium. The target levels that these detectors are going for are, here I put a range of less than one parts per trillion to 100 p parts per billion. PPB levels is even high for what they're shooting for. They're shooting for parts per trillion. Single digit PPT is sort of what they're shooting for. For some materials, they're looking for lower than that. So the amount of uranium and thorium that's just in the crust beneath your feet is six orders of magnitude higher than what they're trying to get in their detectors. So it's a very challenging thing. So just to give you a sort of very simplified view of how, how my, my team works is we work with the physicists um, to sort of develop a detector that they think it will work to try and detect one of these events. And then we work with them to figure out what materials can be used that, are, that will fit their radio purity needs in order to make these detectors highly successful or increase their probability of success. And then once they've identified materials, they send them to us. Um, we use this term assay, which I learned six months ago. It's just a fancy way of saying measure. Um, we'll measure those materials, tell them whether the, the, the radio purity meets their needs, and if not, try and figure out ways to improve it or make it better. Um, and then ultimately that goes into building these detectors um, and what's interesting is, you know, another thing to, that's important to mention is once you turn one of these detectors on, you can't just turn it off and swap out a bunch of material. You kind of get one chance to do this. They're incredibly expensive and time consuming. So it's critical to make sure that all the materials that go into your um, detector are clean enough. So just to give you an example of, of sort of a specific example, Copper is basically, you cannot avoid it in these detectors. Oftentimes they need hundred, tens to hundreds of kilograms of copper, either as shielding or um, in electronics to make these detectors successful. Here's an example. Um, this upper picture is an example of a small version of a low background detector that's in the shallow underground lab at PNNL. All of the copper looking stuff is copper, right? So that's just to give you an example of how much copper is involved in these detectors. When they first started designing and developing these detectors, um, they, uh, 
decided to basically measure a bunch of copper that was commercially available and to find out which one was the cleanest, and then you just use that. What they found out is all commercial copper is way too radioactive to be used in these detectors. What this led to is a, was a huge campaign to develop what's known as ultra radio pure copper at PNNL. And this lower picture here is it in action. They've developed the cleanest copper in the world at PNNL. They grow it through electrolytic methods. And the amount of uranium and thorium in this ultra pure copper is on the order of less than 10 femtograms per gram, which most people have never even heard of femtograms per gram. That's less than 10 atoms of uranium per 10 to the 15th atoms of copper. So, and to do this, it takes them uh, about two months to grow two millimeters of copper. So, but this is the cleanest copper in the world and it makes it so that these detectors have a higher probability of working. And so in order to verify that it's that clean, that's where you know the assay and measurement team comes in. And so we use a lot of unique methods like ICPMS. Here's just a gratuitous shot of an inductively coupled plasma. I think they're really cool. I work with these every day. Um, these are really the workhorse of our assay campaigns or measurement campaigns. Um, these plasmas at their hottest are eight to 10,000 Kelvin, uh, which is the temperature of the surface of the sun. So they're pretty cool instruments. Um, and we get to use them. I use them all the time. They're, they're pretty fun. Um, so that's all well and good, uh, but what are emerging issues where you have opportunities for like active research and development in these types of things? Well, I showed you earlier the uranium, the U-series decay chain. Um, what was a common practice in these early campaigns of measuring all these materials? There's a lot on this slide, so don't, don't focus on it too much. Um, what they would typically do is they would measure one part of the decay chain that they were most concerned with. For example, you can measure radium with gamma counting. And they would assume that the whole decay chain was in radioactive equilibrium. Uh, however, as we get better and better at measuring these things, we're realizing that's not the case in many of these materials. Um, for example, these are coaxial cables, which are commonly used to just transmit electrical signals. They're probably, you probably have them in your house. There's probably multiple in this room. Um, they're used in these detectors. They're concerned mostly with, say, 226 radium activity because that atom produces the type of radioactivity they're trying to avoid. They measure that with gamma counting, and they get a sort of activity measurement of 78 millibecquerels per kilogram. That unit doesn't really matter as much right now, but that's the measurement they get. They take this traditional approach of just assuming equilibrium across the decay chain. That's the activity they're going to apply for, the for that material across the entire decay chain. If you take that same cable, and I just measured one of these like two weeks ago, and you prepare it for ICPMS and you measure it for 238 uranium, you get over 20,000 millibecquerel per kilogram. So it's three orders of magnitude more radioactive with respect to uranium than it is for radium. And what if you just assumed that the radium activity was representative, all of a sudden for this one small part, you've, you've underestimated the radioactivity in your part by three orders of magnitude, right? So that's really bad if you're trying to reduce radioactivity in your material. So this is actually something that is like starting to become a well-known problem with not a lot of solutions. So one reason I got hired by PNNL is I studied this decay chain for six years for my PhD. That's what we use to, to date things in, in volcanology. And so we're just starting to understand this issue. Um, I don't have any brilliant solutions to share with you today, but that this is what we're kind of starting to grapple with, right? This is sort of the next generation of producing radio pure materials is understanding how ubiquitous this issue is and um, trying to develop ways to mitigate it. Um, yeah, so that's what I do at the lab and it's very specific, very chemistry heavy. Um, but I just wanted to point out for those of you that may not be highly focused in chemistry, 
or highly interested in chemistry or physics. There's a lot of other more traditional active earth sciences happening at PNNL. This I just pulled, like I did a cursory look through like news releases from PNNL. There's a lot of work on climate uh, landscape feedback, climate and wildfires. Um, there's a ton of work being done in CO2 sequestration. So there's a lot of interesting earth science work that can be done um, at PNNL that's not specifically focused on these sort of rare event physics searches. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to take a step back now and say, I've been there for six months. It's been a crazy journey. Um, I'm studying things I didn't know existed six months ago. Um, and so it's been quite a learning process. Um, but it's a pretty cool lab and there's a huge, there's uh, over 5,500 employees now and they're actively growing. Um, I work with a lot of post-masters and a lot of post-bachelor's students. So if you're interested in looking at what this type of life is like, you should come talk to me today. I've only been there for six months, so you know they haven't, uh, they haven't fully swayed me. So I'll give you my, my true honest opinion about what it's like. Um, and then I just wanted to show some pictures of Richland because it's a cool place. There's a lot of water. My dog really likes it. She's a weirdo, but she loves the parks. So it's a cool spot. And I encourage any of you interested to come talk to me this afternoon about what it's like working there. <clears throat> um, and for those of you who may be, you know, getting close to graduating or who are, um, you know, looking for a research opportunity over the uh, summer, I just wanted to plug these two, uh, these two links who, these are actively updated um, with current job postings and internship opportunities at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, and I'll share this with the coordinators of this so that you guys have access to this um, afterwards. But come talk to me about it this afternoon if you'd like to learn more. And yeah, with that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Tyler. Questions? And Tyler's going to repeat your question for the home audience as well. So let's go for it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I was wondering what could trigger those separated magma bodies to join together at the last minute before. Okay. Yeah. So the question was what could trigger the two discrete magma bodies to coalesce before erupting? Um, that's an interesting question and an active one of research. The Aruanui eruption specifically, there's some evidence for tectonics being involved. Um, there's evidence for a very large uh, earthquake that occurred shortly before the eruption. Um, how shortly, we can't really be certain. But it's possible that there's some sort of tectonic activity that gives, if there's any, ex there's active extension occurring in the Taupo volcanic zone, that extension is going to provide space. So there might be pathways opening up that allow melt migration to sort of start to begin to pool right at the crustal surface, right at the sort of upper crust boundary before it erupts. So it might be related to tectonics or extension, um, but that's an interesting question that I can't say for certain, but that seems to be the case for Aruanui at least. There's some tectonic involvement. Yes? Anything that you're doing, or how, how is the work that you're doing there? Are you thinking about geological processes differently, or is that bringing insight into um, some of the volcanology as well? Yeah. Uh, so the question was: Is the work I'm doing at PNNL sort of the, the geosciences are in helping inform those processes, or how I think about those things? Is there any insights into the geosciences that I'm getting from that? Um, Stay tuned. I, I think I'm still drinking out of a fire hose trying to come up to speed with what I'm working on now. So I have the framework of geology, so it's easy to apply, you know, fractionation processes and element mobility, like that kind of thing. Um, I would say I do a lot more hands-on analytical work and method development now. And I think I see a lot of opportunities to bring that to the geosciences, you know, I think PNNL is very much focused on capabilities and pushing 
what we can do with instrumentation. And I think oftentimes in geosciences, we end up using instrumentation as maybe a black box for data collection. Um, and so there might be a lot of insights into how to probe these things in a more, I guess, targeted way. Um, but I'm speculating. That's just, that's where I kind of, at, I haven't thought about this much. That's where I see, that's the insight I see bringing over to the geosciences um, from the lab. Yes, sorry. No, it's you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <okay>. sorry. <laughs> um, you were talking earlier about how um, uh, the development of the crystallized version of brown zircons in the mixing stage wasn't long enough for portal. The, or you weren't able, or the uh, analytical tools you were using at the time didn't allow you to measure that. Limb. What aspect of it? Is it just that you're there's not enough room there to like burn off to get the data from? Is there a better instrument that you could to get that data from? Yeah, so the question was, um, why didn't the, the two different zircon populations, why weren't we able to measure a homogenous rim on zircon surfaces, um, the whole rock zircons? Um, so the method itself, the, the shrimp method, it typically, it's kind of a, uh, different version of laser ablation. It, it does consume some material. It tends to burrow about two microns into the zircon. So essentially what, what we're saying is the, the age information from the zircon requires that they were growing up until eruption. Essentially, they're all eruption age crystals. But they didn't have enough time to grow that two micron thick surface that's required to be seen by the shrimp. So they, there might be some homogenous rim, but the, the method just can't see it because it requires that sort of two microns. I'm not aware of a method that has the sensitivity of the, to, that can measure trace elements to the level of the shrimp that consumes less material. I guess you might be able to map them with maybe a, a microprobe or something if you had a, an element in mind, but. Evaporating a channel, right? You have to try and you burn through this teeny bit of a layer, right, to really get through. It's, are you able to expand the method from instead of being a channel that you go through, it's now a greater area that you can now get? So they're just a single spot. It's just a single spot. We don't do channels. It's just, it's a 20 micron diameter spot. So there's not a lot of methods with higher spatial resolution than a, than a, than a ion microprobe. Um, at least not that I'm aware of. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Everyone thinks I'm not familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking at the plot of the uh, ages for the zircon, for the interiors, there is at least a one major peak um, in the ages. Um, is there, are there any eruptions that correlate with maybe that was the assembly of? Yeah, so the question is, um, if you remember my plot about with the U-series ages, with the zircon interiors, there's uh, a major peak, there's a, there's a significant older peak that, um, if I remember correctly, is around like 80,000 years. Um, there's, uh, the question was, is, is, can that be tied to any sort of like eruptions or anything? Um, is there any evidence that there was some increased activity at that time? That's hard to know. The One of the issues with looking further back in the Taupo volcanic zone is it's been so active recently that any older material has been covered or blown up by subsequent eruptions. Um, I will say many, uh, uh, most volcanics that are, most zircon work that's been done on eruptions that are pre Aruanui tend to show a similar age peak right around the same time. And so the, the idea is that maybe there was a, the, the, the initial production of the broad mush system might have peaked at that time. Like that's where a lot of the mush system was developed, was in that 80,000 year range, but it's hard to know for sure. Yes? Getting back to the 
why don't we see the rims? And I was wondering if you looked at the last composition in terms of where you were relative to predicted zircon saturation levels, how much zircon growth might you expect? And then kind of related to that, if it was either melt inclusions or mineral inclusion population differences that could tell you a little bit more about the nature of these two different magma bodies that we're getting into. Yeah, so the, the questions were, one, um, Oh my God, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so is there, have we looked at the glasses to, to get a sense of active zircon saturation at the time of eruption? And the answer to that question is yes, there's been a bunch of other work done that, that suggests these magmas were actively zircon saturated um, and actively growing zircon at the time of, crystal, of eruption. They're also, if you see these crystals, they're beautiful elongate euhedral zircon, volcanic zircons, they look pristine. Um, there's no evidence that they were dissolving or under or zircon undersaturated at the time of eruption. Um, and then the other question was if we've looked at melt inclusions or, uh, or mineral inclusions to look at this. Um, I think I, I'm not aware of any. I think that's a logical next step is to see if we can find evidence for this. Um, one issue is that is that where the two discrete populations develop compositionally overlap the broader compositional range of the system. So it'll be, I haven't found anywhere where you see that tight compositional grouping in any other mineral or, or inclusion phase, but um, it would be interesting to probe the melt inclusion record um, or mineral inclusions as well. I think we tried to do that with the, that was kind of the inciting incident of the plagioclase is like maybe the plagioclase hosted zircon are showing something that 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 can help explain this and they're just, they're not. So um, I don't know, this is the first, the zircon surfaces are the first place we've seen evident, strong evidence for two um, different melt bodies. Um, there is some some pressure estimates that suggests there might have been two vertically stacked magma bodies. Um, but the uncertainties on those pressure estimates are pretty large, so it's hard to know. Nick. David at home wonders, uh, uh, what rise in temperature is required to form the convecting eruptible magma body? So the question is, oh, I guess they can hear that. I guess so. They can hear that one. Um, <laughs> so you don't, uh, you don't technically need Heating. These things, they're, they're thermally sustained by crystallization. The crystallization releases energy, which helps sustain these mush systems for long periods of time. What you really need is a pathway. And that's what we were saying is, what are the processes of melt accumulation? That's an active question. Um, there's a lot of modeling work being done to see if maybe you release a bunch of volatiles and those basically cause fluid pathways that the melt can then follow. It's not necessarily a thermal process that will require that once you get a large enough magma body um, convection can start too. Um, however, that being said, there's some work I didn't show here uh, where the plagioclase hosted zircon surfaces, uh, the plagioclase hosted ones do, if you use the, the thermochronology or sorry, um, thermometer on zircon, you see a, a, a positive trend with age where they do seem to be trapping a, a heating event that is not seen anywhere else. And that might just be because they were getting progressively isolated from the system as they grew, because they're getting trapped in the plagioclase. So the plagioclase hosted zircon may be showing some evidence of heating um, that's on the order of 25 to 70 degrees Celsius. Thank you. A couple more? Yes. Frank in East Tennessee wonders, he says he's heard of uh, the lead and the uranium dating before, but wondered what the thorium brought to your data. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, we've heard of uranium and lead dating before, but what does the thorium bring? Uh, well, uranium lead dating uh, is sensitive to a much larger geologic time scale. You can date things that go way further back. Uranium and thorium dating is sensitive to much shorter time scales. 
Um, basically, when you grow a crystal, you, you will fractionate uranium from thorium. And then they will, because they're part of the same decay chain, they will attempt to reestablish equilibrium over time. And you uh, basically, it's sensitive to a time frame of up to 300,000 years from zero to 300,000 years. So it allows you to date much younger processes that are just, you can't do it with uranium lead. Uranium lead requires too much time to start to grow in lead and see it. So the uranium thorium sort of allows you to, to probe these much younger eruptions. You can also do it on, um, on, on feldspars and pretty much any mineral phase you want. You can, just requires much more material. Zircon's great because it has a lot of uranium in it already. One more. Well, let's thank Tyler one more time. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you next Friday. Turn this off? Yeah. Oh, that was a home run. Thank you. That was a home run. I hope you feel good. It did feel good. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. I'm always stressed before, but oh, once I, I get going, I it feel feels you. better. Yes. You get, you get on that horse, you, you start galloping, and it's all great. Yeah, it was fun. Well, I'm going to talk to these folks on the broadcast, but uh, I, I assume there'll check. be a couple of people visiting. Yeah. yeah. And, and Hannah's going to take care of And you're going to stick around for Cornerstone Pizza? Yes. Yep. Okay. I'll be good, good this afternoon. Good. Good chance to visit with you. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Well, uh, another Talk Friday session is in the books. Thank you for joining us. Um, each time we do this, uh, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with the cameras and how to try to capture this the best that I can for you at home. This is a, a new way to show what's going on in this building. And we have a good thing going here. And I saw that we were flirting with 400 of you watching live, which is just terrific. And in case you missed it, next Friday will be a completely different experience. John Schellenberger, who's a relative of Randy Lewis, I think, we still have to work that out. But John has Native American family history, and he's extremely knowledgeable. And most importantly, John is willing to share some of those important stories with us, I think. But uh, I purposely have not checked in much with John. I want him to do whatever he feels like he wants to do. So there's the talk title, which is next Friday, March 3rd of 2023. And now that I think this worked out well with me posting a little thumbnail for a live stream, a scheduled live stream, in other words, uh, I'm comfortable doing that now. So you'll be able to find the link to the Native American talk um, a day or maybe even two days ahead of March 3rd. And so that you can make sure to share that link with others. And I have noticed uh, at least in my own little world, that many of the folks in the Native American community that I'm aware of are very active on Facebook. So I've been trying to learn how to get some of these live talks to connect with the world of Facebook, especially next Friday, so that those that want to be with us live at home uh, from those communities, I, I sincerely hope that they can join us. And if not live, then then in replay, of course. Uh, but instead of Facebook Live, it's going to be YouTube Live like this is right now. But anyway, uh, let's uh, 
Does anybody have any questions for me before we sign off? What about, anything? about anything? Yeah, we got 337 right now, I think. Um, let me scroll back here just a little bit. Uppercase, if you like, if you have any questions for me. Uh, I grabbed one of your questions. It was David, I believe. You heard that. And I don't know if you caught it, but Jeff from Vinman's, who is right there, saw Honey Greg's question. And so <laughs> Jeff uh, was the mouthpiece of Greg. Uh, where can you find the replays? Well, as soon as I'm done with you right now, this will be viewable as a replay. So right now I'm live with you, but as soon as I end the stream, it will be on my YouTube channel. And I have chosen a gray title slide for each of these noon Friday talks. And I need to change the title because if you notice the actual, actual, the actually the title that Tyler went with today was slightly different than what I posted. Another way to answer your question is if you go to Nick Zentner YouTube channel and you click on a playlist called T Talk Fridays, you'll see this one and all the rest of the Talk Fridays that we've done this this point. Uh, it would be great to visit with Randy again. Uh, I'm going to try to visit Randy next week. Uh, we're working on a date that works for him. Uh, I'm just going to drive over and I'm not going to film anything, but I just it's been a long time. It's been six months, I think, since I visited with Randy. So I, I want to, I think he's doing okay, but I, I don't know. And so I don't really have any updates on Randy. Uh, well, I texted him this morning and I said, I'm free both tomorrow and Sunday. Can I come over and visit? He's like, sorry, I'm, I'm busy both days up in Leavenworth at something. Uh, and so he's active which must mean that he's doing well, but I, I, I don't know. What are the dates of my lectures, public lectures at the end of March? John, it's the last three days of March, and the last one is April 1st. So March 29th, March 30th, March 31st, and April 1st. Four nights in a row, and you'll have to look at the last 25 minutes, I guess, of show Z of the Baja BC A to Z series to get the detail and I will be making a video in March sometime, maybe early March, mid-March, with the details, again, to make sure people know about it on the YouTube channel. But otherwise, I'm not going to promote it because I'm worried about having too many people there. And I have seen many uh, hoping that they'll be able to see those four downtown lectures. And you will. They're going to be filmed. Each of the four lectures, are going, the Mount Stewart lectures we're talking about, those will be posted on my YouTube channel. Robert, I will tell Aunt Randy that you all say hi. Jeff, did you want to? All right, well, Jeff wants to visit about something, looks like. And uh, Garrett, I'm glad you're coming all the way from the Netherlands to, to visit Ellensburg. I don't, spring quarter is a long way away. I haven't even thought about the best day for you to pop in, but they'll be, they'll be, <laughs> Once you once you get settled here, Garrett, and you go visit Vinman's and things like that, then uh, we'll figure out how to cross paths. But it should be easy to find me. I, I just I haven't even thought about days of the week in uh, April yet, or late March. All right. Yeah, one last little thing. I, I've been having a blast this week scouting for field locations for a new video that I'm doing with Oregon Public Broadcasting. And uh, I don't know, I just feel like, I don't know why, I'm just sharing it with you right now. I drove all the way to Colotus and had lunch in Connell, where Jeff's family is, and texted Jeff from there. Um, and the episode will be called Ginkgo Flow. And I don't know what the producers will want to do. We're going to film next month, but my, I wrote out a whole loose script idea for the show where we start at the ginkgo vent, one of the flows of the German chocolate cake, uh, along the Snake River, south of Colotus, Washington. And then we follow that ginkgo flow all the way to the Oregon coast. And so some of you saw a photo that 
I took uh, near Bickleton, Washington on Monday, and I was stunned at how many people loved that photograph. So then I'm like, re-looked at the photo. I'm like, yeah, I guess that was a pretty good photo. I didn't even think about it at the time. Uh, so that will be featured as well, I think. But the producers and their budget and everything else, they'll decide. But I just laid everything out. And if, if, if I get my way, I'll be able to film it. Colotus, Bickleton, across the river from the Dalles, and then Yaquina Head at Newport. So that'll be filmed next month with me and this uh, film crew in Oregon, and then a year later or something, it'll show up on television. I don't know what, you know, it'll take forever. I'm spoiled doing this stuff immediately. Okay, that's enough for today. Jeff is still here. He wants to talk for sure. So thank you, everybody. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Oh, the rock liquor has been waiting for the keys the whole time. Come on. You can interrupt me for that. Thank you. Okay. Ta-ta for now. Goodbye. <laughs>